Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to this Welcome Mental Health Award webinar, Looking Backwards, Moving Forward, Understanding How Interventions for Anxiety, Depression and Psychosis Work. I'm Andre Tomlin from The Mental Health and I'm really pleased to be your host today, uh, working alongside colleagues from the Wellcome Trust, including Professor Miranda Walpert, Dr Kat Sebastian and Dr Inyesh Pote, and they'll all be speaking over the next half hour. We've also got short talks from a group of lived experience experts from around the world uh, and a couple of more panelists who I'll be introducing later, more people from Welcome. There's a lot to get through in the next hour. The aim of this webinar is to help you answer all the questions you have about this new research funding call and to help you prepare your applications. There'll be lots of time for discussion and questions, so do please pay an active part in this event. You'll get more out of it that way. Uh, first of all, we want everybody in the webinar audience to complete a short survey, and we're posting the link to the survey now in the chat. Please follow that link and answer the questions that you see. And if you have any questions for our panel, um, we, you can ask those at the end of the survey. So there's about five or six questions in the survey. And when you get to the end, you can ask a question. And you can ask as many questions as you want on the survey. So keep it open, keep it active, and you can go back to it when you need it. You can also vote on the questions that other people ask. So if you see something that you like the look of, please give it a vote and we'll ask those popular questions first. We'll do our best to get through as many of those questions as we can, and there'll be lots more information on the Welcome Mental Health Award website. And we're posting the link now in the chat to that website. There's a huge amount of stuff there. So please look at that page thoroughly <laughs> before you answer, before you ask rather any questions. Um, you'll see that there are a lot of answers there already. We're live streaming this webinar on YouTube. And so the video will be available straight after the webinar finishes. And we're also live tweeting using the hashtag welcome mental health. Uh, feel free to get involved in that tweeting if you want. Don't forget, welcome has got two L's. Welcome mental health is the hashtag. Um, and at the moment, we're going to share a, a sample tweet with you. So if you want to copy and paste the tweet onto your social media and tell people that you're joining in with this webinar, please do that now. And that includes the link to the YouTube live stream. So anybody who sees that message will be able to watch along. Okay, so I'm going to introduce now our first speaker, Professor Miranda Walpert. Miranda is Director of Mental Health at the Wellcome Trust, and Miranda is going to talk about Wellcome's mental health strategy. Over to you, Miranda. Thank you very much. So the inevitable next slide, please. And the next one. So um, for those who don't know, Wellcome is a very large funder of a whole range of research aimed at trying to improve uh, health globally. Um, and we uh, fund discovery research into life, health and well-being, and also fund solutions to three major critical health challenges, of which I'm delighted to say mental health is one of our areas of focus, alongside infectious disease and climate change. Next slide, please. As part of our strategy, we are working to integrate across those four challenges. And uh, we are going to be putting 16 billion pounds to trying to fund and advocate and shape and thought change in relation to those challenges over the next 10 years. And as you can see, mental health is one of those key areas that we are focused on. And I think this makes us the biggest funder of mental health science outside of government funding. So our, our role is to try and get that money out to researchers and others to change the world for the better. Next slide, please. Our focus is on trying to create a step change in terms of finding more effective forms of early intervention. And we are focusing on anxiety, depression and psychosis. In order to do that, we think we need to build a more integrated field of mental health science. And we want to fund research that helps us understand 
how anxiety, depression, and psychosis both develop and resolve, and also drive the development of better ways to intervene early, both pharmacological and non-pharmacological, whether in healthcare or outside of healthcare. And this webinar today is about this very important call, looking backwards, moving forwards. But we also have a number of other calls available currently around interventions for psychosis, around seeking a supplier to work with us on common metrics. And next week, we're launching a call of, on secondary analysis of data. So please check out our website for those calls. Next slide, please. And also be aware that Welcome is still open to mental health funding proposals through our open mode schemes through Discovery, which happen three times a year and are open for colleagues in uh, the UK and in low middle income context to lead, but the teams can be international. For this call that we're talking about today, we are open to global applications from anywhere in the world that we are able to contract with. And we're interested in research that ranges right from the subcellular to the social. So for us, mental health science need to encompass biologists as much as psychologists, psychiatrists and economists. And we're really hoping that some of you listening today will be coming from some of those diverse areas of expertise. And to be clear, we want to fund clinical research that will really help move the needle on potential new and improved early interventions. Though that research can involve a whole range of methodologies, and but it must involve people with lived experience in a meaningful way. And it must use agreed core measures that are available with information on our website wherever possible. In exceptional circumstances, it is possible to, to put in a proposal that doesn't involve the core message, but we want to understand why not. And similarly for lived experience, if there is a reason not to include, we want to understand why. Next slide, please. So moving on to lived experience, this is something that is uh, uh, an ethical position we have taken, partly out of rights and partly because we feel this will actually help us create better science. And I'm gonna now pass on to a video that will talk about our views on lived experience. Great, thanks Miranda, brilliant stuff. Um, just to say to everyone, please do fill in that survey and please do ask your questions at the end of it. This is a really good opportunity with all these welcome people together in one place to get those questions answered live. Uh, and also do have a look at the uh, research funding call page that is being shared in the chat. So you can see all about this call whilst you're watching the webinar. So as Miranda said there, we have some really fantastic YouTube videos um, that are available. We're going to be tweeting the links to them at the same time as showing them here in the webinar. Uh, we've recorded them over the last couple of days with our fantastic lived experience advisors. And they're going to be talking to you all about lived experience and why we need to involve it in research. Excuse me one second, let me just share this so you can actually hear it as well as see it. So lived experience is a unique form of knowledge, insights, and expertise that comes from having experience of mental health challenges. So people with lived experience or lived experience experts are people who identify as having um, anxiety, depression, or even psychosis, either um, have experienced it in the past or currently, and people do not need to have a formal diagnosis or even access to clinical services to be termed as people with lived experience. We believe that embedding lived experience expertise in mental health science can help broaden research and science opportunities that are currently not captured in the system. Lived experience also instills a level of trust in research, which is required for science to be effective and successful in the real world settings. These perspectives from lived experience experts are equally valuable as those of experts 
And we believe that lived experience involvement is a collaborative effort. It should contribute a vital perspective, and also it shouldn't invalidate other people's work or perspectives in the field. Welcome us research teams to involve young people in the research during the Welcomes Active Ingredients Commission last year, which funded research to explore the evidence on interventions that could make a difference for youth anxiety and depression, such as those of physical activity, emotional regulation, and loneliness reduction. When we asked for their feedback on this, many teams told us that involvement of lived experience experts and reached their project added more depth and breadth to it and also made the research projects more useful and of higher quality. One research team in particular told us, and I quote, it was something that I was slightly skeptical about before I started, but the involvement of young people really enriched the project. We get stuck in our ways and doing something outside the box helps shine new light on a subject. And another team also fed back to us that um, the active involvement helped us define the scope of our review, shape our findings in ways which are more meaningful and appropriate and also relevant to young people, and to know how best these findings can be disseminated to other young people. So thank you very much to Margaret Odiambo um, for that great video. It's time now to listen to another talk. Um, it's Dr. Kat Sebastian now, Head of Evidence for Mental Health at Welcome, who's going to be telling us all about this new Mental Health Award. Uh, over to you, Kat. Thanks, Andre. Um, so yes, I'm very happy to be here to introduce our new Mental Health Award, Looking Backwards, Moving Forward. Um, and over the next few minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about the scope and background to the development of this call. I'll then hand over to my colleague, Dr. Inesh Port, who will talk a bit more about how to apply to the call. So um, what is the Mental Health Award, Looking Backwards, Moving Forward? So this call provides funding for teams of researchers working across any discipline of relevance to mental health science. So as Miranda talked about earlier in her introduction, uh, we are interested in mental health science as an interdisciplinary endeavor. Um, and we see these awards as being collaborative. So there's a definite strength in bringing together different disciplines to address the research questions. In terms of what we're interested in, uh, we would like researchers to investigate the causal mechanisms underpinning effective interventions for anxiety, depression and or psychosis broadly defined with a view to informing the development of new and improved early interventions. And I'll unpack this in a bit more detail as we go through the slides. So at a glance, um, due to the size and scale of the awards, um, the career stage that this will be aimed at in terms of the lead applicant um, is those who are leading research programme. But because this is collaborative and we envisage that there will be several co-applicants on the award, we welcome early career applicants to um, be included on the application as co-applicants. Um, and this is a global call. So the host organisation where the lead applicant is based can be anywhere in the world. Um, apart from mainland China and sanctioned territories, uh, which we're currently unable to fund. Um, these are large scale collaborative awards. Um, so we are able to fund awards of up to 5 million and of up to eight years. Um, but it's important to note that we are quite flexible within this. So we're very open to applications that are significantly lower than the 5 million pound limit and significantly shorter than the eight years. Um, and particularly within the eight years, if um, there can be milestones which show progress within that time, um, that is particularly welcome as well. Why did we decide to focus on um, this back translation approach um, where we're asking people to look at the causal mechanisms underpinning effective interventions? Uh, this has arisen out of our active ingredients work, um, which Margaret spoke. Um, so 
flatteringly about in, um, in her video. Um, so over the past two years, Welcome has commissioned 51 teams over two separate commissions to identify and review the evidence for more than 46 active ingredients of effective interventions for youth anxiety and depression. Um, by active ingredients, we mean those aspects of an intervention that drive reduction in symptoms um, are conceptually well-defined and linked to specific hypothesized mechanisms of action. And on our website, you will see um, lots of information about how we've defined active ingredients, um, and you'll be able to access a report which summarizes um, the research that we have funded to date. Um, it's important to note that active ingredients are quite wide ranging. The main thing is that we're interested in those aspects of um, an intervention that are really making the difference um, in driving the reduction of symptoms. But we recognize that they could be very wide ranging, um, for example, from the cellular, such as mechanisms underpinning SSRI medication, right through to the societal. Um, so for example, access to green space and everything in between. Um, and they can be something that the individual can do themselves. They can be something that the um, individual would access through the healthcare system, or they could be part of wider structural and societal change. Um, so this is definitely not um, an individualist approach. So why take a back translation approach at all? What we found um, over the course of this active ingredients um, commission is that there was a lot of evidence to show that, that many of these active ingredients are effective, but there was less research that addressed how and why they might work, um, less on mechanisms, whether biological, psychological or social, or there was a lot, of, a lot of speculation about what mechanisms might underpin an effective intervention, but actually little empirical research that had actually tested those assumptions. So in designing this call, we wanted to address this research gap, um, not just because it's interesting intrinsically, but because there could well be practical implications of finding out um, why these ingredients work. Um, so we can understand more about what works for whom and why, so we can understand the contexts in which interventions are effective and when they are not effective. We might also be able to use this information to refine interventions to focus on aspects that are likely to be most effective. Um, so that will make the interventions more efficient and cost-effective. Um, understanding these mechanisms better may point the way to developing novel interventions. Um, and we're also interested in improving our ability to intervene as early as possible, um, including targeted prevention. So the more we understand about how and why interventions are working, the earlier we might be able to target them. It's important to note that while the original active ingredients um, commissions looked at anxiety and depression in young people aged 14 to 24, the remit of this call is wider. Um, so we've expanded the remit of the call to include psychosis in line with our wider strategy. Um, and we are also not setting an age limit um, on the um, targeted populations. What exactly are we looking for? So for this slide, it's important to focus on the first two bullets because um, these should be the primary considerations of any applications. Um, so we're interested in how single mechanisms at one or more levels of explanation play a causal role in the resolution of a problem. And that could be at molecular, cellular systems or societal levels or at multiple levels. Um, we're also interested in how different mechanisms may interact in the resolution of problems. So um, any research question that tackles mechanisms, whether um, on their own or in concert, are in scope. We also thought that um, it's likely if projects are looking at mechanisms that, may, that they may also end up exploring these latter two bullet points. Um, so how different contexts impact on efficacy or effectiveness of the active ingredient, um, or looking at um, identifying and validating markers that can predict whether an individual will respond to a specific active ingredient. Um, but the primary um, consideration should be the first two bullet points. So 
So a little more about your proposed project. Um, as mentioned, the project must focus on anxiety, depression and or psychosis, but that is broadly defined and you'll see on our website a full definition of the conditions that we um, have seen as in scope. Um, you can look at um, anxiety, depression and psychosis transdiagnostically, but if you do that, we would also like you to look at individual um, common measures of anxiety, depression and psychosis as well. Um, importantly, the proposed active ingredient must be clearly defined and grounded in evidence. Um, so effectiveness must have been previously demonstrated so that it's not um, a forward translation approach where you're testing efficacy for the first time, but you're taking an intervention that has already been shown to be effective and um, showing that it works, how it works. Um, ideally, that should have been shown by um, pre-registered um, RCTs, but you can make your case however you see fit. Importantly, you must use experimental approaches that will provide causal evidence on the mechanisms of action. And as previously mentioned, applications must demonstrate the involvement of lived experience expertise in the planning, design and delivery of research. The focus should be on intervening as early as possible, which can include targeted prevention. But we recognize that this may differ between contexts. Um, so we haven't put an age limit on, um, or a definition on how to intervene as early as possible because we understand that research teams may want to make their own case. And we also understand that um, at the moment, it may be that by studying older populations um, and understanding the mechanisms better, that may have implications for early intervention. Um, so thank you very much for your time. We're looking forward to hearing from you um, and to reading applications. And I'm now going to pass on to my colleague, Dr. Inesh Pott, Senior Research Manager in the Evidence Team for Mental Health, is going to provide a few more details on applying to the call. Thanks. Thank you, Kat. If you could just move to the next slide, please. Great, so as Kat said, I'm kind of gonna be talking about the more, the more practical side of how to apply the call and who can or cannot apply to this call. So who can apply? Um, as you've heard from Kat and Miranda, we're really interested in receiving applications from the full breadth of mental health science, um, which we envision is very broad. So this can be anything from cellular and molecular sciences all the way through to disciplines within the humanities, social sciences and computer sciences, as well as of course, lived experience expertise. Um, we're also interested in receiving applications from a range of geographies, including low and middle income countries. Applicants must, however, be based at an eligible organization that can sign up to our grant conditions. And there's details about uh, this on the funding page. But the organization, so the applicants can be based in quite a range of organizations. So uh, a higher education institution, a research institute, a non-academic healthcare organization, a not-for-profit organization, or even a company. So next I'll be telling you who can't apply. So unfortunately, as has already been mentioned, uh, you cannot apply if you are based or intend to carry out activities that involve the transfer of funds into mainline China or a country that is the target of international sanctions. And we've got information on this on our webpage as well. Um, you can also only be an applicant on a maximum of two applications to this funding call. Um, and if you are a lead applicant on one application, then you'll only be able to be a co-applicant on the other application if you choose to submit two. Um, if you're a co-applicant, however, you can submit two applications. So you can be a co-applicant on two. Um, however, if you do uh, submit two applications to this call, you must be able to demonstrate that you can dedicate enough time and resource to both, this bo both the projects you're proposing if both of them get funded. Um, there's also some guidelines on um, career st stage, so based on your career stage, based on whether you're an early career researcher, a mid-career researcher, or an established researcher, there are specific guidelines on our funding page about how many, uh, how many applications you could put forward if you already hold a welcome award, so please watch out for that. 
Um, in terms of eligibility more broadly, so as Kat Miranda have said, we are looking for collaborative teams to put forward applications, but there is going to be a lead applicant in the application form, and the eligibility requirements and expectations of a lead applicant are slightly different from the co-applicants. So lead applicants must have experience that is directly relevant to the project that's being proposed. You must be able to drive and lead a collaborative multi-standard health-based research project, and important Importantly, you must be able to contribute at least 20% of your research time to this project. Um, we also expect lead applicants to have a PhD or an equivalent qualification and to have significant postdoctoral experience. Um, they should also, the lead applicants should also already be leading a research program. Um, they should also have permanent, open-ended or a long-term rolling contract or the guarantee of one. Co-applicants, we're a bit more flexible on the requirements of a co-applicant, so co-applicants can be at any career stage, but their expertise must be essential for the delivery of the project and their contribution to the project must be clearly justified in the application. Um, they must also have appropriate time and necessary resources available to deliver the project, but they do not need to have a permanent, open-ended or long-term rolling contract. In terms of the team, so we really, really encourage lead applicants to put together diverse and multidisciplinary teams. And again, there's information about what we mean by diverse on our funding page. Um, the team size will really depend on the projects that you're putting forward, but we expect that the teams will usually range between two to eight applicants, including the lead applicants. And as I've said before, you should really uh, explain um, what the applicants bring to the project and make sure that all the necessary expertise to deliver the project is represented in your team. Um, and again, um, you might want to consider involving lived experience experts in your project teams, for example, as co-applicants or co collaborators. So this slide really shows you the key dates. So from now until the very end of when decisions are made. So the next key date is the preliminary application deadline, which is on the 24th of May. And everyone uh, that wants to apply needs to apply with a preliminary application. So that's a really crucial step. Um, once you've applied with a preliminary application, we will then spend the month of June shortlisting uh, the applications received, and we will invite shortlisted applicants to submit full application uh, by the end of June. And then applicants that have been invited to submit application um, have until the 13th of September to submit their full application. We will hold interviews in November and then um, a decision will be made in December. So how to apply, um, quite important. If you're interested in applying, I would suggest that the first thing you do is you um, access this funding scheme page. The link's on there and will be, I think is already being shared on the chat. So please do really review this funding page in detail. We have tried to be as explicit and as transparent as possible about what it is that we are looking for and who and who can apply. So please do review that in depth. I would also encourage you to review uh, the useful documents that we've attached. So we've put a couple of um, commentary pieces that we've written and we've put the active ingredients report there and we've added some information that we would really like you to review. So please look at that in detail. Next, if you've decided that you want to apply and you're eligible to apply, uh, the way to uh, submit a preliminary application is to go to the Welcome Grant Tracker um, and to submit your application via there. If you have not used Grant Tracker before, then I would really encourage you to register as soon as possible and to review the guidance on how to use that platform. As part of the submission, we require you to um, upload an additional information document uh, to, your uh, to your preliminary application. And there's a template that we provide in the useful document section and the grant tracker will also kind of alert you to submitting this. So please do look at that template that we've provided, completed and uh, uploaded as part of your preliminary application. Um, and yeah, as I've said, the applications are due on the 24th of May at 5 p.m. British Standard Time. And please do submit by the deadline. We unfortunately will not be able to consider any applications that are submitted after. Um, 
so in terms of the assessment criteria, we've again tried to be really transparent with this. So the full criteria and the weighting uh, that we will use to assess the applications, the full application stage are on the funding scheme page, and they're broken down into four sections. So we'll be looking at the research question and the strength of the methodology proposed, and that will be weighed at 40%. Uh, the suitability and expertise of the team will be weighed at 20%. We'll also be assessing your plans for lived experience involvement, which is also weighted at 20%, and then also the suitability suitability of the research location, the environment and the culture, which is also weighted at 20%. At the preliminary application stage, we'll be using a simplified rubric, but we will be assessing all of these points. So again, I would encourage you to uh, look at the scheme page because all the detail on the assessment criteria that we will be using is there um, for you to look at. And then finally, um, just a note on contacting us. So I'd like to stress that you do not need to contact us before you write and submit your preliminary application. Uh, and all the information should really be on the scheme page and you should be able to make an assessment about whether your pro project fits within this, the scope and whether you're eligible to apply. So please do use that as your first port of call. After having read that in detail, if you still have a question, um, then feel free to contact us. Um, if you have a question about how to complete the application form or more technical question about how to use Grant Tracker, then please contact our grant information advisors. You can send them a message or you can ring them up. If you have a question uh, about eligibility, uh, what we offer or our funding agreement more generally, um, then you can contact the mental health team. Uh, but we will not be answering specific questions on the scope or competitiveness of, pro of proposals. So please do not send those through. And yeah, then finally, I just wanted to say thank you for listening on behalf of the whole mental health team. Please access that webpage because as Miranda said at the very beginning, there are other funding schemes that we have open at the moment. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Inyesh. Lots of information to take in. Um, we will be sharing all the slides and the videos afterwards with you all. So you'll get an email via Eventbrite with all this stuff. Um, but we're going to have a couple more short talks now from two of our lived experience experts, uh, Veronica Wanyi and Tanya Padilla. And they're going to be talking about how you should involve people with lived experience in your research. And then after these videos, we're going to be breaking for a Q&A. And so you'll have your opportunity to hear the answers to some of those questions that have been put. So please do keep those coming in. And here is Veronica. I think there are many ways that you can involve and collaborate with people with lived experience. That might look like having expert advisors or involving people with lived experience as co-researchers and co-applicants, or even having an advisory group. Um, at Welcome, I think we're really open to any methods and roles that teams might choose, but we do expect lived experience experts to be involved in meaningful and appropriate ways in multiple stages of the project. So from delivery to design to dissemination, um, it's really important that as you involve people with lived experience, you don't um, make it tokenistic or make it a tick box exercise that people lived experience are involved in ways that are appropriate for the research aims and the different stages of the study. I think the first thing is to make sure that lived experience is central and guides multiple aspects of the project. So whether that's from designing the research or when you're collecting and analyzing data or when you're sharing and disseminating your findings, making sure that that's guided by the insights you get from lived experience. Um, but it's also really important for you to recognize people with lived experience as colleagues. They bring real expertise to the table and so they deserve to have the same respect as you would give any other member of your project team. Um, and in that same line, then you should pay your lived experience advisors and compensate them appropriately for the value and the experience they're bringing to the table. Um, but as much as they're bringing a lot of expertise, 
uh, lived experience advisors are still individual people with individual experiences and so they cannot on their own fully represent the different intersections of community and context and so it's really important for you to have diversity within your team um, and especially within your lived experience advisors um, and I think also it's important for you to um, be flexible when you involve people with lived experience to have conversations on how you want to collaborate with them um, and with the rest of your colleagues uh, to discuss what some of your shared values are and what some of the ground rules will be. several points I have in mind. Um, the first one is don't treat people with lived experience as research participants because those two are different things. Um, you should involve people with lived experience as you know experts and, and try to involve them to inform you about um, your research process, you know, the delivery, the governance, and the design of your research. And you can do that by um, involving them to be co-applicants or co-researcher, um, collaborators through advisory groups, or just gathering their perspectives through workshop or online discussions. And the second point I want to make is um, don't ask for their personal stories or their mental illness background. I mean, they they could share that, but only if they feel comfortable to. And, it's not necessary for them to do that because that's not why they're there. They're there to um, provide you with their expertise. And uh, instead, you could more ask about their opinion about uh, various elements in your research. Um, and the third point I want to make is about um, don't involve them in small or insignificant ways. And by that, I mean, um, for example, you only ask for their opinion after the major decisions about the project has been made or you ask them at the very end of the process so their ideas cannot be implemented anymore so uh, it becomes futile and uh, it's best to make sure that their opinions really matter and uh, inform the decision making of your uh, research process and i think the last point i want to make is don't be too rigid on the involvement uh, many individuals can it can contribute in many different ways. It really depends on their preferred way of working. You could um, involve them by through workshop or through emails and etc. Uh, I think it's also important to remember that we're all as a research community still learning about this because this is a very new thing and we're still learning about how to best um, collaborate and involve people with lived experience in mental health science and particularly at Welcome, we're also on this journey and we're very keen to learn from other organizations and research teams. Um, and with the Welcome lived experience teams, we will be running workshops with funded teams to uh, about lived experience involvement to enable them to learn together and share their practices. And I just hope that by normalizing uh, the involvement of lived experience in research, uh, like we're, we're getting close to our goals to make uh, mental health science to be more applicable and beneficial in real world settings. So thank you very much again to Margaret and Veronica and Tanya. I'm sure you'll agree those were fantastic videos about lived experience in research. Um, I'm sure we'll be able to cover that more in the Q&A, which is going to start now. So um, I will ask all of our panellists, please, to put on their cameras and microphones. 
and we will crack on with the questions and answers part of the webinar. We've still got 21 minutes left, so we're doing pretty good on time. Um, you know most of the people on the screen already, but I'll just introduce the people you don't know. So Kate Martin, Dr. Kate Martin, hello Kate, is Head of Lived Experience at Wellcome Trust. Uh, and Dr. Lindsay Billsland, hi Lindsay, is Head of Mental Health Translation. So we're all gonna now have a chat. Um, and my goodness, lots of questions. Um, I'm gonna start off, I think, asking Kat about big versus small because there's been a lot of questions that have spoken about big versus small in terms of the projects. So, you know, it might be as big as five million pounds over eight years, or it might be much smaller, you've said. And also big versus small teams. Um, there's lots of questions about that. So can you just kind of give us a sense of what the kind of confidence interval is around the, the right size of these sorts of things? Yeah, good question. Um, the reason we've kept it quite flexible is that we know that there are some methods which may not require huge amounts of resource, and we didn't want to put those out of scope. Um, the main thing is that we do want these projects to be bold and ambitious in their scope. We want them to um, use new collaborative methods that maybe haven't been done before, um, and we recognise that that often does require large resource. Um, so, yes, while I don't want to say um, that any project is out of scope, I would say bear in mind that we're likely to be judging the applications according to those criteria, that it needs to be collaborative, big, bold and ambitious. And I guess following on from that, we've got quite a few questions as well about senior PIs versus more junior PIs and who should be the co-PIs. And questions relating to, you know, is it important that the person leading the project has a, you know, big publication record? I guess a lot of the active ingredients projects that you funded previously over the last couple of years were led by more junior people. Um, do you wanna say something about how you're gonna kind of measure the success of these based on who's leading them? Sure. Um, so important to note that the, the scope and nature of these projects is quite different from the active ingredients projects, which in many cases were led by early career researchers. Um, and we're really committed to supporting the careers of early career researchers. Um, however, because we envisage that the size and scope and complexity of these projects is likely to be on the higher and larger side, um, that's why we have stipulated that the lead applicant should be um, at the more established end of their career, have years of postdoctoral experience and be leading a research group. However, because of the collaborative nature of the projects, I think that there is a good opportunity here for early career researchers to be involved in quite a meaningful way as co-applicants and leading specific work packages. Um, in terms of how we will be um, weighing up the lead applicant, Yes, um, publication record is important, but we would also be looking for evidence of previous collaborative working, previous management of complex projects um, to show that um, they have a track record, not just in publication, but in the kind of bold and collaborative ways of working that we're trying to promote with this call. And just to be clear, because I think often with research funding, it needs to be a university person that leads these bids. Is that the case as well for this? Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a university leading the call. Um, NGOs are eligible, companies are eligible. Um, however, any leading organisation would need to be able to sign up to our grant conditions, or if they worry that that's not the case, or they might be um, IP issues, for example, um, they should contact us for more information about how to negotiate that. Okay, thank you. Miranda, a question about global, the global aspect of this, um, because obviously you're looking to get applications from all over the place. And it's, it's really encouraging that a lot of the questions that have come through have said, you know, is it okay if I apply from Nigeria or is it okay if I apply from Malaysia? So do you want to give us a sense, first of all, strategically about how you're going to um, try and ensure that you do get 
global applications or the work that you've done already, I guess, to make that happen? So, yes, yeah, so so we are um, we are global, uh, subject to the constraints of where we're allowed to contract with, as Ines pointed out. And we really are looking for diversity of applications and diversity of thinking here. So we really welcome uh, applications from anywhere across the world and from any combination of researchers or groups. And are you doing anything to kind of encourage particularly applications from low and middle income countries over high income countries? I guess there's a big, there's not a balance currently, is there? There's a lot of inequalities here. So what are we doing to make sure that we get So I think that's a, a very good challenge and one we're thinking about longer term within welcome more generally. For this specific call, the way we've tried to address it is that we are um, trying to make as transparent as possible absolutely everything about our criteria and about how we are um, assessing and how we are opening uh, our applications to people. But there isn't a specific route in and there isn't a a specific uh, amount of, of funding targeted for a particular geographic population. Okay. And thinking about co applicants and applicants again, I, Somebody asked a question about um, how the lived experience advisors kind of fit into the team, because you've described teams as being maybe two to eight people or maybe as big as 10. Kate, how do you see this working? Could a lived experience person be a lead applicant on a project? Do you see them fitting into that core team or do you see them sort of part of a lived experience advisory group? Give us a sense of the different ways that people could organise this. Great, uh, really great question. So absolutely. So I guess the first thing to say is when we see lived experience as a form of expertise, that form of expertise also sits alongside all sorts of other forms of skills and expertise. So it's it's quite common that people, uh, mental health researchers, experienced mental health researchers also have lived experience expertise. So certainly if there's a lead applicant, if they have, if they meet all the other conditions and criteria, of course, that person may also have lived experience expertise. However, we're trying to think about how do we bring in additional expertise, lived experience perspectives throughout the course of a project proposal program. Um, and so that means, I guess, we don't want to define what methods are most appropriate for engaging people, lived experience experts. What we want to see is that those methods are most appropriate for the proposals at hand. So that may include co-applicants with lived experience expertise. It may include um, uh, uh, researchers with lived experience expertise within the team. It could be an, an advisory group. There's all sorts of different methods. Essentially, we don't want to define them what, and they will change, I suppose, for the, pro- for the different proposals. What we're looking for is that lived experience expertise um, uh, is um, involved, engaged in the best ways using multiple approaches throughout the course of the project as relevant to make sure that the, that expertise is informing and shaping those proposals in the best way possible. So uh, I don't want to be to define which ways, but just say we expect multiple approaches um, and, and open to uh, all sorts of different methods. And following on from that, if people are thinking of applying and this is their weak spot, mm-hmm. they're thinking, oh, I'm not quite sure how to do this. This is all a bit new. Mm-hmm. Um, what support are you going to give them you know, not just now at the beginning, but also during the projects to make sure they do do it well. Sure. And that's one of the most interesting things for us about the research that we're funding is that we, as Miranda said, make a um, a commitment to ensuring that the research and the work that we fund uh, involves people with lived experience expertise. We're also really conscious that, that practice is more or less developed in different areas of mental health science. So we're really committed to learning alongside all the teams we fund about different methods, models, approaches. Um, so we'll be running workshops for uh, teams who are awarded funding. Um, and we will be w- working alongside those teams throughout the course of their project to really try and understand what people are trying, what's working, to enable people to share practice and learning. Uh, so really trying to learn alongside those teams and provide the relevant support. So just really conscious that there's, you know, this is a new evolving developing area, particularly in certain areas of science and methodologies, and will um, enable teams to connect together uh, and share their practice as well as learn alongside us. It's really encouraging looking at the survey results that almost everyone is saying that they do understand what's meant by lived experience involvement. Um, maybe just about seven or eight percent saying not sure and actually well over half probably two thirds have previously involved people with lived experience in their research so maybe we've got a sort of slightly skewed sample here in this audience of people that are looking for welcome funding but um, Miranda I wanted to also ask you about the kind of interdisciplinarity of this and you're obviously trying to get people in from all sorts of different areas of mental health science the work to date has primarily primarily been funding psychological science 
um, and in kind of social sciences and looking at the audience here today, that's true of this meeting as well. Um, half of the people here are from psychology um, and then there's a mix of other areas, but we've got nobody from pharmacology, very few from neurology, limited from cellular and molecular, limited from cognitive neuroscience. What's, um, what's needed, do you think, that's a big question, what's needed to kind of make sure that we're bringing in all these different groups? Uh, again, a great question and actually a, a challenge for us and for the group. It, uh, so we, when Kat was saying what we're looking for, we want to see that, that mixture between those different groups. So we want to see people reaching out to their colleagues in biology, in cellular systems, in sociology to, to build teams that will look at these things from a number of different ways so that we can get new insights. So one that the challenge for us is making sure we are reaching all those diverse groups and we're looking for people to spend this time to really try and create teams that will be able to answer those questions, which might include animal experiments, might include human experiments, might include um, uh, observational. There's going to be a range of different methodologies people may want to use, and we will be looking to see how people are doing that to answer this crucial back translation question. Okay, so let's talk a bit about mental health conditions, because you're focusing, Kat, on anxiety, depression, psychosis. We've had quite a few questions saying, you know, does that include... <laughs> Um, so what's the kind of scope? I suppose anxiety is quite a broad you know, area. Psychosis is quite a broad. Have you got a kind of definition on what's included in all of that? So, uh, yes, we recognise that it is a very broad definition. Um, so we're saying that um, OCD, so obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder would also be in scope. And then within the psychoses, we would say um, diagnosis of schizophrenia, postpartum psychosis and bipolar are also in scope as well. Um, and I think I've also seen some questions um, asking about whether they should, conditions should be looked at singly or together. Um, we are agnostic as to approach. Um, you can look at a single diagnostic category. Um, you can look at how an active ingredient um, impacts more than one diagnostic category. Um, or you can look at transdiagnostic targets um, that are important for these disorders. Um, however, what we would ask is that you do keep your focus on these conditions and that you um, include common measures um, of anxiety and depression that we have laid out for our common measures framework. And that for psychosis, um, you, we don't have a common measure yet. Um, so there we would ask you to choose an appropriate measure. I think Miranda would like to come in on this question as well. Yeah, over to you, Miranda. Thanks, that's okay. It's just to add on exactly what Kat said and just to say that we, we do recognise these um, uh, diagnostic categories are imperfect and flawed and we are not requiring people to believe in any particular diagnostic categorization. We are using them as a way of, of defining group constellations of um, experiences and behaviors and thoughts and feelings that hold people back in life. And what we're trying to do is find interventions that will help people not be held back. So we are using these because we need to use something in order to talk with people about the broad things we're looking at, but we are not requiring anyone to subscribe to a particular form of diagnostic categorization. They just need to be clear in, their, in the application what, how they're conceiving of the issue. Thank you. You speak about effective interventions and looking forwards. So what constitutes evidence of effectiveness for an intervention? Uh, Kat, is that one for you? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to this. I mean, I, I alluded earlier that um, there's no one size fits all answer. Um, so we've said in our scheme page that um, ideally um, a pre-registered RCT would be the gold standard. Um, however, we recognise that that may not be appropriate for every ingredient or every discipline. Um, so we would ask you to make the case for effectiveness based on the evidence that is available. Um, you may want to look, for example, at effect sizes or of the quality of the studies that have been done. Um, but we purposefully didn't require, um, for example, an RCT um, for this precise reason that it does differ so much across mental health science. And what about clinical and cost effectiveness? Are you also looking for kind of economic evidence of effectiveness? 
I think that would be, um, so we're interested in understanding how these interventions work, um, but I think it's fair to say that um, we would be, if there's more mileage in looking at interventions that we know are likely to be cost effective, that are likely to be scalable um, across settings, including low resource settings. Um, so um, we will be taking that into account as well, um, but um, I think the main thing is effectiveness and the um, identification of putative mechanisms that um, can be understood through the methodology that's proposed. Can you give us an example? I'm, I'm, I'm struggling, and I'm, I imagine other people are struggling with that kind of actual real example of a specific research question, um, because you say that straight intervention trials are not in scope. So doing an RCT of a specific intervention for depression is not in scope, but that if you focus on the mechanism of how that is working, that it is in scope. So could you give us an example of out and in of scope? Um, yeah, so, um, for example, so a trial method that would be in scope that would look at a mechanism. So it could be that um, you would do a trial, but then also be taking additional um, sort of cognitive or um, neuroimaging measures that would look at the, the underpinning mechanisms during that trial. So that would be in scope. Or it might be that the design of the trial itself um, draws out underlying mechanisms. So for example, um, if you're looking at social context, um, looking at is an intervention effective in one po population but not others, there might be um, conclusions that you can draw about the mechanisms that might be underlying that effectiveness from the context that you're choosing. Thank you. Okay. Um, people are asking questions about the uh, length of time with Easter in the way uh, about applying for this. Are you really clear about the deadline for applications here in Yesh? There's no leeway on that, is there? No, unfortunately, there's no leeway on that. We've given people, I think, eight weeks um, for the preliminary application. Um, it's not a super long application that we require at this stage. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, um, it has to be the 24th of May. Easter is a couple of weeks, so there's still quite a lot of time between Easter and the 24th of May, I would say. Yeah. Randy, you've got your hand up. Is that a legacy hand or you want to come in? Uh, it was actually just because, um, uh, Andrew, when you asked Kat the question, you phrased it as saying that trials were out of scope. And I think just want to be really super clear that trials are in, in scope. I think Kat made that completely clear, but she was too polite to actually just say to you, no, trials are in scope. So I just want to say it so it was on the recording. Um, yes. But with the, with the caveats that Kat has said about wanting to understand the mechanisms, because I don't want to put anyone off applying with a trial. Yes. OK, thank you. That's clear. Kat? I just wanted to add to what... Ines said, um, so for the preliminary application, um, my understanding is that eight weeks is on the longer side for what we, we usually offer. And then similarly, um, for the full application stage, um, just wanted to address in advance that we do acknowledge that this does cover the August summer months. Um, we've taken that into account by um, typically, um, we give applicants eight weeks to write their full application. For this case, we've given 11 weeks, um, taking into account that there will be a need for summer break during that time. Okay. We've got about 50 questions to get through in the last couple of minutes. I'm going to try and get through as many as I can. I'm, I'm basically going through the list in terms of how they've been voted up. We've still got 150 people in the webinar, so maybe we will run over for five minutes or so. I'm sure everyone will stick around. Uh, Kate, this first one is for you. How people with lived experience, having people rather, with lived experience on the research team is laudable. How achievable is it for non-clinical early career researchers or others with less power to open doors or harness interest from lived experience groups? It's, well, I, I, I guess the question is, I, I, there'll be multiple ways of collaborating with lived experience experts. So I guess the question is about how powerful, it, how possible it is for earlier career researchers to collaborate with lived experience experts. Is that right? Okay. I think get access to them and collaborate, yeah. Fine. Okay. I guess that these are some of the questions I guess we're interested in exploring throughout this is that we know that in different, cult, different contexts, different setups, different organisations, collaborating with lived experience experts uh, looks different. Uh, there are some systems where this is very well established and very set up. 
others where it's more new and emerging. Just, to, I guess, to be clear that we'll, we'll take that into account at the early, but the pre-application stage and the full application stage is um, understanding are the methods are most appropriate for the research proposal, but also understanding the context and the setup of the teams and the research systems in which, which they're working. Um, it's, it, it's more challenging in some areas than others. Um, uh, it's hard to sort of give a more specific answer at this stage, but we will sort of reflect on, on that during the, the pre-application phase. And to make sure, I guess the other thing to say is we want to make sure this is appropriately costed and built into the research proposal itself. So we understand that involving people in the early stages of designing applications is particularly challenging if resources aren't available. We will take that into account. That's why it's not mandated that people have to be involved in co-design the actual application itself. But we do want to make sure that people are involved throughout the research proposal. And that's make, and at that point to make sure that's appropriately costed so that it is supporting um, new and emerging and establishing relationships to undertake this kind of research. Okay, great. Thank you. That's clear. Oh, this is a quick one, Kat. Um, do we have to select one of the active ingredients studied previously or can we select a new active ingredient? Really good question. No, you can select your own active ingredient. It doesn't have to be one of the ones that we've already covered. We just include all that information to give you as much information as possible about the type of um, intervention that we're looking at. Um, so ideally, we want people to look um, not at kind of composite interventions or interventions where there's not a clear um, mechanistic underpinning. Um, and that's why we've given all these examples of the active ingredients research so far. Thank you. In yes, building on what Miranda was saying earlier about low middle income applications, uh, crafting a good engagement strategy in the UK is much easier than in Peru or Guatemala because of different levels of organisation and cultures of engagement. Will these differences be accounted for? Yeah, absolutely. I think we're going to be reviewing the applications through you know, the context in which the applicants are submitting their applications from. So we would consider these in that way. Okay, thank you. Kat, I welcome interested in research looking at symptoms of anxiety, depression and psychosis in specific populations. Yes, that would be in scope. Great. Okay, um, we're slightly over time. Sorry, uh, just as long as, you, sure. um, as long as you would take the, the common measure of anxiety as a whole rather than specific symptoms. But yeah. yes. Specific yeah. populations are in scope if the focus is anxiety, depression, or psychosis. Thank you. Okay. So I think I'll end on this question, if that's okay. Uh, Miranda, maybe this is one for you. Um, will there be similar calls in the future, or is this a one-off? Is it part of a mental health strategy? It's absolutely part of a mental health strategy, and there will be future calls. Uh, what we're still debating is how we will focus them going forward. So this one is specifically on back translation. There will be more forward translation uh, calls in the future. There may, there may be more specific calls on specific topics. We're thinking about ways that we can engage with the community more widely to get for you to give us ideas so that to help us think about what sort of calls we might put in the future. But there is much more money to come, which we are really excited about. Our only job in the world is to get money out to you as researchers to do great research. So, you know, start preparing, start building your teams, start thinking about how you can bring the most innovative ideas together. And if you've got ideas of how we can level the playing field between low middle income countries and um, uh, other countries, we're very interested to hear them. If you've got ideas around how we can develop future calls, very interested to hear them, but this is the start. Wonderful. Thanks very much for joining us, everyone. We hope you found this useful. Um, thanks to all of our speakers from the Welcome Mental Health team and to the brilliant lived experience advisors who recorded their talks last week with us. As I said, all of the materials and the videos and the slides will be emailed out to you later on today via Eventbrite. So do look out for that. And good luck with your applications, everyone. Okay, see you again soon. Thanks, Andre. Thanks all.